right, so uh, we have this traditional startup competition that we're doing every year at the Digitalk at the end. I know that you're all tired and you want to go and have some rakir with me later, but <laughs> before that, <laughs> we have uh, three amazing companies that we, uh, we selected yesterday from, from the semifinals. We had an amazing jury of uh, around, like I think we were 12, uh, 12 uh, investors from uh, top VC firms, investors that we at Launch Ventures we work with already and we did some co-investments or we know each other quite well. So those guys were listening to the pitches and uh, it was very, very hard. So we were actually late announcing the results because we couldn't decide, but at the end, we, uh, we selected three companies that you're gonna see here. Uh, every company presents for four minutes, four minutes pitch, then we all as a jury ask questions. Then at the end, for, we have like a, a minute or two that we that <laughs> discuss between each other and we announce the winner, he gets the check, and we go to drink with Kia. So that's the plan. Uh, first, uh, wait. What's the, do I have a list of the startups? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who is first? Danny, who is first? Hmm? Jason, yeah, okay. Please welcome on stage Jason with Illumnar. <laughs> Woo! Uh, I think. Is this working? Hello? Hello? Okay. So, hi everyone, my name is Jason Lee, and I'm the founder and CEO of Illuma. So, our value proposition in one line is that we can help you better understand and predict patterns of behavior that affect your organizations. And to do that, we're spinning off some fantastic technology. It has over a decade's worth of academic research behind it. And what, for me, makes our data analytics software so unique is that we can take your data and we literally self-organize it in 3D to reveal previously hidden patterns. And what makes this unique globally is that we actually have a new methodology in AI, in unsupervised learning, and a proven ability to reveal insights that all other methodologies and tools may miss. So I go into global organizations and say, we can find stuff that you're blind to, and we've done it time and again. So the problem we solve is that billion dollar companies are spending billions annually trying to uncover the rules linking human behaviors and business activities. And through data mining technologies, they try to find patterns such as, are these insurance claims fraudulent? And that's fine if you know what you're looking for because you can train up a neural network to find those kinds of things. The problem comes if you don't know what you're looking for. Let's say you're trying to uncover a new method of fraud, for instance. The only way to find that emerging signal is to get in a trained data scientist with a PhD and they have to come up with a hypothesis as to where that emerging signal lies. And it can take months to prove what is proved. So it's very, very time consuming right now. And the fact you've got a human in the loop means you've got human bias involved. And that means you may end up with a solution that overfits. It actually doesn't match reality. So what Illuma does is it recognizes the strengths and weaknesses of the human brain and information technologies. And we leverage the computational power of computers to turn your data sets and the insights that exist within them into understandable patterns that our brains recognize. We can then identify interesting patterns and feed it back to the computer. And it's through this unique human-computer interaction, we actually have a proven ability to find insights that all other tools may miss. But as importantly, we do this in a hypothesis-free environment. So sometimes those patterns are things that have never been seen or even hypothesized before. And we do this fast as well. So we can take in your data on day one when it's dirty and get your first actionable business insight in hours or days, not weeks or months. So we're part of Founders Factory. We went to EasyJet to the HQ in, in London. And uh, we looked at uh, 100,000 bookings that were sampled over two years. And when we self-organized that data, we realized there's some really interesting small clusters. We looked at one of those clusters, and in that cluster were customers that were eight times the average business value, highest value customers for EasyJet. And when we analyzed them further, we realized their behavioral traits were things like they traveled for both business and leisure purposes. Why is that important for EasyJet? Well, they didn't actually know about these customers, because their customer segmentation tool force fits them into human biased categories like travel or, or, or business. So we've done this time and again. On the left, you can see some of the big corporates that we've worked with, like the MOD on countering terrorist networks, Unilever with their brand with proposition, Bank of Sabadell have given us repeat orders already for pilots. They're all being paid. And we've got a huge pipeline. We're actually top 20 uh, Vodafone company right now, startup. Uh, we're in the top 10 finals for Pfizer right now in life sciences. We're the only AI company there. And we're currently on site at Rolls-Royce trying to solve their billion dollar engine problem that you may have read about in the press. So we've got an amazing team backing this. You have to do something like this. Uh, George is our chief data scientist, PhD from the University of Cambridge. He's an expert in cognitive science and neurocomputational modeling. Ian, our CTO, is an industry-recognized expert in enterprise-scale data architecture. He actually wrote the MOD and NATO enterprise architecture frameworks. And we're backed by an amazing advisory board. So everyone from Dr. Rana Ghosh-Roy, who's the director of analytics at Deloitte, 
Uh, Hannah D is the founder of the Entrepreneurship Centre, the University of Cambridge's uh, Cambridge Judge Business School. And Nick Halstead, famous guy, he's uh, raised nearly 100 million for all of his companies. He only advises two startups, and we're one of them. So we're currently fundraising right now. We're looking for a million, and that will give us an 18-month run runway in order to do three things. We want to build the core team. We want to complete platform development over the next six months, which we've already proven the technology works. And we want to sign those lighthouse customers who have already given us uh, money for their paid pilots already. We've already got a term sheet, so we're nearly there. We're only looking for one or two investors to complete the deal. So if there's anyone in the audience who's interested, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Thank you. Questions, Diane? Can I ask? Go for it. Who, who do you uh, sell to and what's the sales cycle approximately as yeah. well as the initial deployment? So are they doing a test deployment and then yeah. you have to upsell them to a greater... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So our, we are a B2B company. So, so a little bit more on that. Once you're, once you're out of this development stage, what's yep. the repeatable sales cycle? Who are absolutely, you going to sell yeah. to? Who's, yeah. who's the target customer? What's going to yeah, be yeah. the thing that you get to replicate over and so over? So we are again? one of the one in 10 uh, horizontal AI platforms out there. So you know, most people are solving verticals. So we go across a number of different verticals. We're testing them all right now uh, before we go to market. That's, our, that's why we're doing the, the pilots. So we don't know where the traction is going to be. So when we do know the traction, we can start focusing whether that's going to be financial services or life sciences, for instance. And um, you know, the monetization route for us is twofold. So we're going to have a desktop tool that becomes all the GDPR issues that data scientists can use it next to their own data sets. And that'll be sold on a monthly recurring revenue basis. But we're also monetizing it through the strategic consultancies. So Deloitte, for instance, who are working with us on AML and, and, and audit projects, they're solving you know, $100 million fraud problems for the banks. And they want to bring us in to do that. So through that mechanism, we can also monetize a bit like Palantir. Can you tell me a little bit more, when you're in the sales cycle, who are you running into the most? Like, who do you consider your top competitor? Yeah, so our top competitor is IASD uh, out of Stanford. Um, they are our proxy for revenue. They have a solution that uh, is also very unique in its methodology. Uh, they've raised $97 million to date. Uh, but their solution sells for a million dollars per annum. So we know they can actually sell into the corporates, into life sciences, into financial services. The competitive differentiation we have against IASD is that Every node on the screen is like a, a bin, and into that bin can be multiple data points. It could be a thousand, it could be a million. We have a node on the screen for every data point. Uh, so we can see very, very small emerging signals. So in life sciences, it could be a subpopulation of clinical trials data that give a better cancer outcome. Or in financial services, it could be a new fraud methodology that's never been seen before. So that's kind of where, how we're positioning it. You mentioned some of the initial customers you've been talking to already. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through the sort of uh, onboarding and what a deployment looks like in terms of like how you're integrating the data there and how long that process so takes? So we're not at that point yet. Still, we're still developing the product. So um, we're developing initially a desktop-based tool. In about two years' time, we're going to have an enterprise class uh, tool. But at that point, you've got systems integrators involved, and you've got to actually in integrate into the enterprise. So right now, it's a very, very uh, clear product. You know, we give it to the data scientists who are already domain-level experts. You know, they know what to look for. And this becomes, if you like, an additional tool that they have to put into their workflow. Because we have a proven ability to you know, find insights that all other tools may miss, they kind of have to use it. And if we can actually target the, uh, you know, the, the prime players in each of the verticals, then you know, it's their competitors that also have to buy it to, to, to maintain competitiveness. Did you say it was two years until it's ready? No, no. Uh, the, des the desktop tool right now is what we're using uh, to, right. for the paid pilots. But the MVP will be five to six months. OK. How long have you worked on this? Just just give us some context. How long have yeah. you actually been working on it? Absolutely. This? So the company started four years ago. And um, at that time, we won a bid with the MOD, looking at counter terrorist networks. But it was too early, literally too early. So we've actually uh, been dormant for a couple of years. It's really only been the last 18 months that everything's taken off with the AI, that we've actually found a focus, uh, been able to actually you know, target the big players. And they've now got the interest in the budget. And you know, we've reached that point where it's, it's taking off. So that's the journey. It's an interesting mix of customers, but where, where have you been acquiring them from so far? Uh, so we've already signed up the bakery, uh, Founders Intelligence, um, De uh, Deloitte are making introductions right now, and we've already been on Accelerator, so we're part of Founders Factory, and obviously, you know, L'Oreal and the others, uh, you know, it's that kind of route to market that gives us a lot of exposure, a lot of credibility, um, so I'm, I'm keen to do that and, and get the exposure through events like this as well. I think we're running out of time, so big round of applause for Jason. Good stuff, bro. Good stuff. Uh, next one is Mark Bola from Nasekomo, which is like a very, very interesting company name. It comes from a Bulgarian word. Nasekomo. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for uh, letting me pitch today. It was a great surprise uh, to be uh, selected. And, uh, 
Honestly, I didn't understand why, because we thought we were kind of uh, outside the main focus of uh, digital. And then I thought about it and I said, okay, this, the jury, probably it's the sadistic aspect yes. of uh, our project, because yes, we're going to talk about probably one of your worst nightmares. Uh, Nasekomo is about billions, maybe trillions of insects. Insects everywhere. Insects in your plates, insects in your head, insects in everywhere in your nightmares. So, what's the vision? We have different options. Yes, who has seen the Blade Runner 2049? Yeah? <coughs> yeah, so many people. Okay, great film. If you haven't, then after today, you can go to the next door cinema and watch the film. The first action scene of 2049 actually takes place in an insect farm. So the vision is here, 2049, we all eat insects. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it's our only protein source. Why? Because in 2049, we'll be 2.2 billion more on the planet, and we all know that our Earth is currently struggling to feed us already today, so 2049, total nightmare. For example, if we think about fish, in 2049, if we keep on fishing our ocean at current rates, there'll be not a single fish left in our oceans. On the other end, we waste like crazy. For example, 40% of uh, all the fruit and vegetable we produce, we dump in our beans. Crazy. So that's where we come in, because compared to 2049 Blade Runner's vision, there is a little window, a little opportunity, and that's where we want, you want to invest in Nasekomo, because we don't want to feed insects to you. We want to feed insects to our animals, that our livestock, our salmon, trouts, poultry, chickens, pigs, and then we keep on the party going. Okay? So Nasekomo is that little window um, we can work on. So how does it work? We have found a machine that has the capacity to eat this organic waste and transform it, yes, into valuable proteins, also uh, fat, to feed our animals. This machine is actually a fly. It's called the black soldier fly. Every female has the, produces 900 eggs, wow. and each egg turned into a larvae that has this tremendous capacity to multiply its body weight 7,000 times in just two weeks. So we feed the insects with the organic uh, waste, we transform them into different products for animals, and we feed our fish to start with. What's the market for this? Currently, we're going to firstly target the EU fish feed markets, $29 billion turnaround, and after, we have access to the entire world market. How are we going to do this? Our vision is to set up a network of farms. There are two types. There is a hub where we breed the insects, we produce the baby larvae, and also this hub uh, will process the larvae into end products. And then around this hub, we have a network of smaller farms that we put next to an uh, organic waste producer, and that's where we grow the insects. Um, we feed and grow the insects. This is our growth plan. We are very ambitious. Uh, but to do this, we need to develop a new technology, uh, farming 4.0 technology, where we're going to use uh, quite a lot of sensors. These sensors are going to monitor the environment of our insects, and then we're going to feed the data into an AI engine. That's going to pilot our facility. And uh, robots are going to take care of uh, our insects, they're going to feed them, they're going to water them, they can uh, manage the ventilation, etc., etc. This is our investment plan. We already raised 1 million euro, and we are currently seeking 5 million euro to go to the next level, which is building an actual uh, large, uh, fully automated farm. We want to meet uh, our ecological and social targets, like proce processing uh, organic waste. Uh, next year, we want to process 50 times more organic waste, 25,000 tons of waste, and that will allow us to save 50 times more uh, wild fish. We also want to meet our targets on emission and reduce emissions of methane, 143 tons, also CO2, 1,000 tons next year. We've talked about insects. We've talked about robots rapidly. 
the third species involved here is humans. So we have a very good human, almost sapiens sapiens resources working around us. I'm kind of the technical guy. Uh, part of the, the co-founders are um, Xavier and Oria Marsenac. They are uh, also the founders of uh, TELUS, who is the sponsor today. So they have a good uh, track record uh, in terms of business. And yes, we are building a very strong team and we have a super wise advisory board. So yes, the BSF, our insect is ready to help us. We thank you very much for this opportunity again. And uh, thank you for your attention. All right, I'm looking for some questions. I think there's something so about eating insects that will always bug me. But uh, <laughs> um, no, that, that was really interesting. Um, on the sort of like longer term vision, uh, you, you briefly alluded to it, but is, th is there an idea that you become a direct to consumer brand as well, or it's more sort of you're, you're behind the scenes and selling to some of these food producers and themselves who own the brand piece? Well, being a Bulgarian company, project, and EU, uh, we think the value for the short and mid term is very much on animal feed. On the longer term, uh, there are some uh, big markets for insects for humans. Mm -hmm like Asia or Africa, but it's kind of not our current focus. We want to focus on animal feed. And there is another option, which is the, the processing of the organic waste. And we call it insect as a service, because it renders a service in terms of organic waste. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, so I'll, I'll give you that's the first time I've ever heard insect as a service. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you <laughs> see, you know. here's some interesting I hear a lot here. of stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah. Insect as a product, insect as a service. That's have the two focus we want. Have you, have you actually um, ground up, the, I don't know what you do with the flies, mash them up or whatever, and like fed them to an animal for an extended period of time and, and seen what the results are? I mean, it's like a great vision, but the only thing that I, I couldn't, like, it would be great if you had some data and then actually maybe even had a human eat it and not die. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to see that sort of life cycle or hear about it, hopefully. Sure, but what's happening is that we've actually starved our livestock. A chicken naturally eats 50% insects in its diet. Currently, we are feeding them with soya, which is absolutely not part of their diet. So bringing back insects brings so much positive results. Welfare, health, growth, quality, everything is positive. It's also, we get very good results uh, on fish. Uh, being in Bulgaria, we target, for example, uh, the Greece uh, aquaculture. They work with sea bass, sea bream, and so on. Very positive results. We are bringing back insects in their diets, in their natural diets. So when, when you say very positive results, what, what exactly is happening? So positive results from a cost perspective, from a better animal health, more meat, like what, what exactly does that mean? Cost, we're not there yet. We need the technology first. So we are developing here. The benefits right now and that are very positive is health. Very positive impacts on, uh, for mortality rates, for example. Uh, you know, it's an issue in our industrial farms. Big mortality, bringing insect back, less mortality, very positive. Um, uh, growth rates. Quality of the, the, um, the, the end products, like uh, eggs, for example, you know, you, you get the very yellowish eggs, the one full of the nice nutrients we're looking for, these kinds of very positive results. So how is, it, how is this a venture and scale business? Uh, how do you grow this to be something really big and, and, and put up kind of a moat around competitors? Because I know there's Next Protein and there's, there's another one that I know called Ecto something. That, so there are a few other people trying to do this. How does this not just turn into like an infrastructure type business and more into a venture kind of defensive business? Well, there is this market for the feed to replace uh, to find alternative proteins, there is this challenge. And this is a long-term challenge, I mean, 2049. So that's part of the business. The second aspect is the technological aspect. So uh, once we've developed the technology, we can like franchise it and uh, develop a European and then world, uh, at the world level, uh, our technology. And these are the yeah, two main uh, aspects we can uh, develop our business on. So basically, if I understand well, you, you figure out to have some kind of a, you know, like a container that it's uh, like a micro factory that you can produce more, a lot of them and scale up 
Yeah, container, it's an idea. Out. I mean, maybe not a container, but, but like maybe something the size that you deploy and you, yeah. that's how you grow your business? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it, that's kind of how, but the container is too small. Too okay. small. We need something a little bit larger. Uh, the, what we are looking at is to have a technology that we can adapt to already available warehouse so that we can deploy fast and not to have to build around our technology, new building, etc. But uh, yeah. What does the regulatory approval process look like and how far are you in advanced in that, that journey of getting re regulatory approval, I'm sure, like feeding, feeding insects to livestock? So the good news is that uh, since July 2017, uh, the market is open for the fish in the EU. So, and uh, currently no one is addressing this market. I mean, uh, yes, there, is, there are several uh, different projects uh, in the EU, but none are already operational. So that's the very positive regulatory aspect we are working on. And uh, we are also a member of the European Union of Insect Producer. Yes, there is one. <laughs> and we are lobbying at the EU level to open the, 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 the chicken market. And the perspective is positive. So in the next one or two years, big opening expected. And then in the foreseeable future, we we'll go for the, the pig market. But I mean, if we only replace 1% of the total feed market, we have an avenue in front of us. It's, it's huge. All right, we're running out of time, so thank you very thank much. You, thank you very much. Give a big round of applause. Because this is the first time ever we heard the term insect as a service. <laughs> Come on. So la last, last uh, startup that is going to pitch tonight is uh, Krasi Nikolov from Quark VR. Woo! Where are you? Oh, there he is. All right. Looks like I'm the last guy standing between you and Rakia. So <laughs> I'm going to keep it short. My name is Krasi. I'm CEO and co founder of Quark VR. And I'm here to talk about the future of spatial computing and virtual reality. Virtual reality is a new, very exciting medium that inspires creativity. If you try a good VR experience, you'll be blown away by it. In VR, you can design a car. You can understand how the engine works in 3D. I'm fascinated by this whole idea of spatial computing and how to engage our 3D senses. There's one small problem today with VR and it is that there's too much technology in the way. We need less friction for VR to become mainstream. The good thing is that in technology, we've been here before. Less than 20 years ago, in order to enjoy a movie or listen to a song, you had to download it. And how crazy is that today when you can stream endless content instantly? So the question is, how do we get VR from today, where you're tethered to a piece of furniture, to the future where it's all seamless spatial computing? We've developed Quark VR to help with that. It's essentially a compression and streaming technology. We call it infrastructure as a service for VR, not to be confused with insect as a service. <laughs> and it works, and it works by having a server that can take any VR content, compress it, and stream it wirelessly or even over the internet to any VR headset. So you're untethered and you don't even need to have a computer to stand between you and your VR experience. What makes us special is our ultra-fast GPU compression technology. Quark VR takes two and a half million pixels as an input and it calls them in one millisecond. I want you to think about that statement. There's nothing on your computer that performs faster than one millisecond. And we're opening our technology to a very exciting market. If you're an OEM that wants to create an untethered headset, you can use Quark VR in our reference design. Quark VR enables enterprises to start using virtual reality today without upgrading their existing computers. And with technologies like 5G, 
we're bringing Korg VR to the cloud and thus opening virtual reality to a mass consumer market. We already have a paying customer, Orange Silicon Valley, and you can walk into their San Francisco office today and try seamless untethered VR experience powered by Korg VR. And we have very exciting pilots in the pipeline with companies like NVIDIA, Dell, and HTC. Our team is one of the most experienced teams in virtual reality. Combined, we have over 70 years of experience in VR, gaming, and the enterprise applications. Today, we're raising a million dollars to remove the friction of using virtual reality and make the spatial computing future today, make it happen today. I hope I managed to inspire you about what's coming with spatial computing and virtual reality. So I thank you for your attention. All right. Shoot. So to get this deployed, you need to plug into all the OEMs, right? You need to be plugged in, baked into the, to the headsets and the, and the technologies. So, yes. Um, we, first of all, you ha we have a reference design for an untethered headset that you can use today. But the exciting thing is that on the market today, you have all-in-one headsets like the Vive Focus, the Oculus Go, that have the, all the required components uh, for, for, for Quark VR. And we already support the Vive Focus, and we're going to soon support all of them. So essentially, uh, you need to just install an app um, and in, in case that, in case of our customers, which are, which are enterprises, those will be pre-installed by your um, IT administrator. So it's a pretty seamless process. So uh, as you alluded, there's a number of companies that have this technology in place today. Some of them have hacked it together themselves for use, and some of the big companies are also work like Oculus are integrating it. Um, it, it seems like this is coming. Uh, anyway, so if it is, maybe I could explain why you think if it is coming, you're going to be a key player in it versus right. like the OEMs just doing it themselves. Right. So, so the first thing that we need to understand is that uh, those all-in-one devices, those are still running a mobile processor. So the fidelity uh, that you get there is uh, not less smaller than the fidelity you get on an Oculus or an HTC Vive. And for the most exciting applications of virtual reality, like designing a car, like um, uh, uh, working on uh, uh, learning a new language, uh, the, those experiences need more horsepower. Having uh, photorealistic graphics requires more horsepower. Mm -hmm. So you always need some sort of a back end that is rendering all that pixels. So it'd be cool if that doesn't make you be tethered. And then the other, the other point is that um, it, Quark VR is not just a codec that is going to be in a, in a headset or, or in a computer. We are providing the computational platform for this next generation of spatial computing and virtual reality and augmented reality. So there's always going to be value for Quark VR, which is basically offloading all the computation to some server. So there's two-way communication. Basically, you're feeding then back a lot of data so yes, that it can recompute. Yes, yes. Okay. But as I said, our innovation is on the compression and streaming um, uh, side where we do a new way of compression very fast on GPUs, uh, which is very efficient. What, what, okay, sorry, guys. Uh, what, what's the protocol that you would use to get this compressed data from the headset to the server back and forth? Is it it's our Wi-Fi? Own. Well, it, if, if it's running in the uh, same network, it's Wi-Fi. It can go over the, mm -hmm. uh, over the Internet. It's our own uh, protocol. But is it Bluetooth? Like, well, how do you see no, that no. last so Bluetooth five doesn't have feet? enough uh, doesn't have enough bandwidth, uh, which is right, very Right, that's what I was thinking. And uh, you alluded to companies doing wireless solutions today. And what they're essentially doing is they're uh, transmitting raw data over something called 60 gigahertz network, whereas we do compression, which is cool because, first of all, Quark VR runs over Wi-Fi. 
which has a less bandwidth. And second of all, we are future proof because in the near future, the resolution will become from 2K today to 4K per eye. So you won't have enough bandwidth to stream raw data. So to answer your question, Quark VR can run over Wi-Fi, Ethernet, what have you. And how do you monetize this? What do you charge? So we are licensing uh, Quark VR to um, OEMs that want to create wireless headsets or enterprises that want to use VR. Uh, we license them uh, GPU servers. And we are working towards the uh, GPU server not being on premise, but being in the cloud in a data center. So essentially there will be licensing for, the, for that to happen. And we're doing our first pilot of that later this year with HTC in Paris. And then on the, the enterprise side, you were mentioning that there's two streams, I guess, to the, to the business model. What's, what's the traction there directly with the enterprise trying to build the VR experiences? Right. So there are a lot of uh, very interesting use cases in enterprise VR. Um, I mentioned uh, companies like Volkswagen and Audi designing cars in VR. Another interesting is training companies like IKEA and UPS, training their employees in VR more efficiently. Uh, distributed teams collaborating in VR more efficiently. So a lot of revolving around design, education, and training. So I, I don't have any questions about sort of the technical stuff. It, I assume it works and... You can check, me, check it out. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, so I don't have any questions about that part. Where I actually have questions is actually more about the VR market. Um, so for me, where just like, it's been super hyped for a long time, right? So tell me about sort of like adoption. Like when do you think sort of like adoption from a B2B side is gonna I happen? It. I love this question yeah. because I just came back from Croatia where we had uh, this panel about the false narratives in the VR market. And um, the thing that you need to understand is that we are seeing uh, a lot of real, uh, real life applications of VR in the enterprise. Not so much on the consumer mm -hmm. side, uh, because of the price and the, and the friction, but a lot in the enterprise. And uh, I, I talked about the designing and training and so forth. So on the enterprise side, is actually there's a lot of adoption and companies like HTC, they've switched their models to be almost entirely focused on, on enterprise. Um, and HTC is an investor in our company. Um, so enterprise is very exciting. Other areas that are exciting is location-based entertainment, which is arcades. This is huge in Asia, especially in China and Japan. Yeah. Um, and then education, also huge in China. So uh, I mentioned the Vive Focus. And now there are schools in China where we have thousands of students that go to class and they have a VR headset and they learn about the Great Wall of China or what have you in VR. So these are the two main areas where we have a lot, actually a lot of traction, but um, we don't hear about it much in uh, mainstream media. As you move more towards that spatial computing vision, you see, do you see com competition from, from folks like Improbable, like who are extremely well funded and I think trying to tackle that too? So uh, they're actually probably solving an, um, another side of the, uh, of, of the problem is how to run the game engine efficiently in the cloud. Whereas we're, we're uh, providing the infrastructure of getting what's rendered to the user. So it's kind of a, I think we're, complimenting uh, them in a very good way. Good. Awesome. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! I don't need that, but okay, thanks. All right, Steve, we need you back here because you need to entertain, uh, dance a bit, like I tell a joke while we're <laughs> discussing. So we need our mics to be cut off for a while. I'm discussing with those guys. You dance during this time. And we, real time, we, we're going to decide who is the winner. And then I need this here to, to write the winner's name. So I can cut there. So there we go. I want to see a raise of hands, like audience opinion. We saw three great startups, three finalists. So we're going to go one, two, three. I want to see a vote. Which of you guys think startup number one should win? Come on, one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
10, you're like, uh, uh, maybe I'm not so sure. 10, just 10 of you. Wait, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 back there. Okay, startup number two, show of hands. Oh my God. I'm not sure I can count that many. All right, put your hands down. Startup number three. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, okay. I think two's got it, but number one, guy, sorry, you're out. We're going to go two and three again. Yeah, yeah, one's totally out. You guys are totally lost. I'm sorry. Well, maybe not, but anyway. Okay, let's do two and three again. Between two and three. Number two. Oh, I think you've got it. Put them down. Number three. Oh, shit. It's actually pretty close. I know, I know. I think number two has it. I think number two has it. All right. By the way, I have seen soldier flies all over. Uh, we were just in the Royal Academy of Engineering with Lino sitting over there with, over there with our photographer, Dan, who's completely ignoring me. Black soldier flies we have seen all over the world as, because uh, that was number two, yeah? As a, a huge... I don't know, resource for protein, food, animal food, fish feed, all these kind of things. And uh, I'm actually, myself, probably Lena as well, impressed at how the soldier fly has just taken over the planet. <laughs> it's going everywhere. I don't know how much time they need. I think we should put a bet on this, all you number twos and number threes. Number ones, I'm sorry, Lena, you are way out. We should put a whiskey bet on it. Those of you who lose, should actually at least give some bakshish, a little tip to uh, <laughs> the nice barista and whiskey servers out there and get, stand in the queue and get the whiskeys for the others who won. Um, that being said, I think they're writing it right now. Uh, I would like to thank Stefan, I'd like to thank Gargana, I'd like to thank uh, Galia and all the people from Media for doing an amazing job with it. yet another DigiTalk. And obviously you guys. Mike's back on. They have reached a conclusion. And, and I want to know if the audience was right. Drum roll. I didn't hear there was a... <laughs> we, you guys were focused. We had a vote. Yeah, exactly. We had an audience vote. We went for number two. Oh, really? Start number two, Black Soldier Flies. Well, um... Almost. No. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Almost. Okay, so the winner off. of this year's startup competition is Elon or... Jason, he's coming from the Startup Sesame program in Sofia, and he runs with a check of 10,000 euros. Come on, guys, come on.